All right, thank you. So this is my tech tourist mode, a guide to the NetHack code base, AKA I learned C so you don't have to. So your tour guide today, my name is Alexi Peppers or at AM Peppers on Twitter. I am a technical designer at Improbable Canada and I've been realizing no one knows what that is. To be fair, it's a new studio. Um, short, short elevator pitch, Improbable makes Spatial OS, which is this cloud-based platform for like massively persistent, scalable online games. I mention this because like A, we're hiring. B, uh, I would love to see a roguelike on Spatial OS, man. Someone look into it. This is just a personal thing I want. And more important to this talk is that I am a lifelong NetHack fan. So despite um, my age, <laughs> which is NetHack was a little bit before my time, but my mom loves NetHack and she played it when it was newer. And so when I was just a little child, I could talk to her about NetHack. And then, you know, long before I had access to the NetHack wiki, if I was having trouble, I could go pull on her apron strings and say, hey, mom, I keep dying of starvation. What should I do? And she'd say, well, darling, have you tried eating corpses? I was also a speaker at Roguelike Celebration 2016, where I've met some of you. I was talking about making roguelike games, and particularly NetHack, more accessible for visually impaired uh, players, which was a great talk. Um, and in the process of that, I was looking into making changes to the NetHack code base to make it more accessible. You can find that talk online. Um, on the roguelike YouTube channel and things like that. But the point was that I went through the NetHack code base, which was a really interesting experience for me as someone who'd always been a fan of NetHack. And I noticed so many interesting things that that was kind of where I started wanting to do this talk and I'm glad to finally get the chance to because the code base is actually fairly accessible, which I'll be talking about, but it's kind of intimidating and it takes uh, a certain amount of confidence in your technical abilities to say, I'm gonna pull down the source code and have a look. So I'm gonna show off the things that I found that were particularly funny or interesting uh, to highlight it in case you don't have the time to go through the source code yourself, even though I encourage you to. And the start of all of this, and this is one of the only ones that involves some technical background because mostly I'm keeping it very tech light, but there's a concept called string concatenation, and it's very simple. You have strings, which are like text, and concatenating is sticking two of them together to make a new string. So you take net and hack, you make net hack. And because programmers love to take all the vowels out of things so that they have as much screen space as possible, uh, this is usually shortened to string cat or str cat. And now in NetHack, they have a little optimization, which is that if instead of concatenating two full strings, you just have a string and a single character, you can do that in an optimized way, relying on the fact that one of them is shorter. So this is a special optimized function, and what is it called? String kitten. Because <laughs> it's a little string cat. <laughs> this is the cutest function name I've ever seen in my life. And when I saw this in the code, I thought I have to give a talk and make sure that as many people as possible know that the string kitten function exists. And so along that vein, if you've ever been playing NetHack and you were crushed to death by an owlbear or a snake, I have good news, you weren't crushed, you were hugged. <laughs> hugged to death, because it is attack type hug. Do you need to know if you're engraving in slime? Just check if the jello boolean has been set to true. And along that line, if you want to know how an animal grows up, if a little dog comes a big, big dog, check the grown-up survey. Uh, make sure to reference cuddly to know if it's an item that you can use the rub action on. <laughs> don't forget to rename disco. And don't get confused between kick object and really kick object. <laughs> Now I will say NetHack dev team, if you're watching, I'm not putting you on blast, I swear. I just think this is really fun. NetHack also has an interesting relationship with the concept of dogs. If you have any type of pet, their behavior is handled in one of two files, dog.c or dogmove.c. So if you want to have a new pet, you have to call make dog. If you want to make sure they stay with you when you transition levels, you call keep dog. You need to know if you have the right kind of dog food, which, you know, if your pet is a, uh, a white or a ghoul, dog food is corpses or rotten eggs. Uh, you have an array of my dogs. Again, this can be, you know, dragons, elves. And don't tell PETA. <laughs> but an errant kick results in a call to the abuse dog function. 
Now, something I also find interesting about the NetHack code base, and this is a, a really like mileage may vary one in that it is, you know, been in development for a very long time. It was you know, originally from back in the 80s. And so you can see the evolution of not just the code, but of time passing as you look at the source code. Uh, one of the more clear examples being that the original uh, year, month, day function could not handle dates in the 21st century. It was hard coded in to start with 19. Uh, and that has now just been commented out because, you know, who would have thought that NetHack would still be played in the 21st century? I mean, I think that we knew, but. And you might also find other cultural references and, you know, for some people maybe this is like a, a reminder back of the good old days and for people like me you learn something new. For example, I found a function called mung spaces and I thought, what the hell is a mung? <laughs> Turns out it's a terminology from the Tech Model Railroad Club at MIT, standing for mash until no good or mung until no good in typical programmer recursive humor. And so that's like a new hacker vocabulary I'm gonna start using to be cool like the 80s. There's also uh, some cool community references like who here has uh, participated in the DevNull NetHack tournament at some point in their lives? Maybe some people? No one was in DevNull? Okay, a few hands. Did you know that there's special code to handle the most unique desk competition at DevNull? Specifically, not letting you spoof slime mold fruit names in order to fake more interesting deaths. So it's neat to see evolution of uh, community integrated into the source code itself. And there's interesting cultural references, such as this very accessible reference to Junior Pac-Man in terms of being able to see pellets being eaten when they're on screen. For one thing, I thought Pac-Man was always only one screen. And Pac-Man, yes, Mick, Miss Pac-Man also, yes, but I didn't know there was a junior Pac-Man. Maybe that just says more about me than about anything else. Uh, but sometimes there's also the opposite, such as this comment explaining a joke about Trident chewing gum, saying it was a sugarless chewing gum which used to be heavily advertised on TV. I think fair to say we still know what Trident is, though I did a little bit of looking and the old commercials are a little bit more frightening than I remembered. But it's not all just fun and games, though I will emphasize that is just a small slice of all of the kind of amusing references and jokes you can find in the code. But it's also a chance to kind of learn from the masters. NetHack is, you know, one of the core canon kind of roguelike games. And if you're one of the you know, many people here interested in making your own roguelikes, having a chance to look at that source code and see not just where it is now, but you can see through the history of it and through the comments what kind of process led them to the NetHack of today. It reminded me that I saw on Twitter a while ago that The Great Wave, which is a very well-known painting, the painter actually created it multiple times in his life, iterating on the idea until finally, in his 80s, uh, creating the painting that's so well-known today. So NetHack has gone through this iterative process, and you can look at the final product, but also look back, and you can learn from all of these lessons that the NetHack team uh, accumulated over many, many, many years. And the reason why you can do this, even if you don't know C, is because NetHack is actually extremely well commented. I found this shocking. <laughs> not as a, a slam on NetHack, but just because code in general commenting is not, you know, code comments itself, right? But NetHack has entire uh, paragraphs and paragraphs of description of how the code works in plain English, so that even without a C kind of technical background, you could read this and learn something from it. So in this example, the display.c file, which handles displaying you know, ASCII and everything like that to the screen, starts with a very long description of exactly what the NetHack display code is doing. There's also uh, small segments that are more to do with game design considerations. For example, if you look at the code for eating, you'll find that it explains that the reason why any kind of non-food item, like if you're a rust monster or something that can eat metal and you're eating metal objects, it always takes only one move to eat, even though other types of normal food objects can take longer. And the reason that they explain is because they didn't want to have code dealing with what happens if you eat half of a piece of plate mail. 
And you can find these little tidbits, or how the code for using a stethoscope notes that it doesn't really make sense for stethoscope usage to not take any amount of time, but they were worried that if it took time, then it becomes quite useless, and plus they can have the curse be more of a negative if it starts out taking no time at all. And there's lots of these little nuggets of design wisdom that you can learn from as you go through the code. You can go to an area that relates, like you know, maybe your game does a lot of stuff with different types of monsters. If you go to the code dealing with monsters, you'll find these little pieces of wisdom in terms of what kind of things did they consider to arrive at the design that they have today. And these can be quite long in the same way that the technical description can be quite long, even involving almost narrative concerns. Like, you might notice that I think this might have come in in newer versions of Hack, but, uh, net hack. Hack is different. Usually I can get away with that, but you guys know better. Uh, <laughs> but you can find in the early levels of the dungeon other dead adventurers who are killed by traps and they have certain useful items on them. And there's a very long comment explaining exactly what thought process led to that feature, what decisions went into what kind of items you could find on them, what kind of traps they decide to include and which ones not to include from a game balance perspective, from a narrative perspective. And it's just a, a gold mine in terms of lessons to apply to your own roguelikes, or just a deeper understanding. If you're a fan of NetHack, you can learn why is NetHack this way, kind of straight out of the mouth of the dev team by reading their comments. And even when it comes to the individual code, so something like this, this is some code dealing with what kind of things you get when you offer a sacrifice and can get an artifact in return. And if you're not super comfortable with C, this is probably not particularly readable, unlike the Python that we saw this morning, which was much easier to read. But the good news, in the actual code, this is what it looks like. There are comments not just at the beginning of functions or at the top of files, but there are often inline comments throughout an entire piece of functionality describing in plain text what that code is doing. So, even if you're using a different language, even if you're not familiar with C, you can go through that and you can read the comments and you can explain and understand what's going on and learn some lessons for your own game. There's also, I wanna highlight some of my favorite kind of tricks that the NetHack code uses that I want to steal from my own games, basically. Uh, one of it is that there's an idea of different kinds of body parts. So it starts out with a definition of a humanoid, which is easiest to relate to. So humanoid creatures have arms and eyes and faces. But then what they do is that they have another list that matches and has the equivalent body part for another type of creature. So a jelly type creature will instead have a pseudopod where an arm would be, a dark spot for an eye, etc. And animals can have four limbs instead of arms, four claws and instead of hands and things like that. And they have this simple kind of setup and array, it's quite readable. And then when you have an actual place in the code where it needs to use that, for example, if you step on a bear trap, it wants to say, since you know, NetHack uses a lot of text output like most roguelikes, it wants to say the bear trap closes on your foot. Now if that was kind of hard coded to say foot, then if you were polymorphed into an acid blob, that wouldn't make a lot of sense. But because they have this array, they have a very simple body part function where you put in what the humanoid equivalent would be and then you pass in an actual reference to the person, the character, the creature that is having this action happen to them. And it will deal with going through those arrays that I showed you to figure out, oh, foot in this case means pseudopod. Or, you know, in this case, this is the code for if it's your steed who stands on the bear trap. So likely most of the time foot gets turned into hoof. And of course, since this is NetHack, it's not just that there is these arrays, but there's also a whole bunch of exceptions where, uh, of course, sharks, as we know, do not actually have scales, they have skin, and it's very important that we have this distinction in the code. They also do some clever things with function naming other than just making adorable string kitten names. Uh, since there is a lot of text output, and a lot of it is phrased as, you know, you feel hungry, you have a sad feeling for a moment and it passes, they have a function called you that handles that type of output. And so when you're reading it in the code, you read 
you move very quietly or you float imperceptibly and you don't have to think about the fact that that's actually like a p-line function with some extra you know stuff around it to make sure it outputs correctly you just read it in plain english and it actually is a function call and will handle all that extra cruft. So I think that that's some really clever function naming. They have other equivalents that make it very, very readable and kind of abstracts away some of the stuff you wouldn't have to worry about. They also have these ASCII diagrams and they're the coolest thing ever. <laughs> so this is the code for handling throwing a boomerang. <laughs> And it describes all the traversal patterns that a boomerang might have in counterclockwise or, as it notes, clockwise if you just reverse the rows. And it's so nice because you look at it and, you know, you can see that that's what it is, that it's a boomerang, and you can see how it would work. And it's so much more readable than if there was a bunch of, like, English text trying to explain, like, well, if you're standing in this square, it should travel one diagonal and then two to the north. Like... It's taking advantage of the fact that the game itself is using an ASCII grid to have that in the comments and have a very visual representation of how the code is going to behave, which I think is just really brilliant and readable. And this comes up in other cases. The boomerang is my favorite, but in terms of figuring out the range of a pole arm, they have a nice little grid showing in numbers how many squares away something's considered to be. Or there's an entire file dealing with the uh, code associated with that ball and chain you can get in NetHack if you're cursed. That's actually, it's, it's complicated. It's got a whole file to itself, ball.c. <laughs> and it has lots of these little diagrams showing that like if I'm standing here and the chain is here and the ball is here and I move this way, how should it move? And all of these are very easy to understand because they have little ASCII diagrams showing what that looks like instead of trying to describe it. So as long as your game is also using that kind of ASCII thing, you can steal this technique and have much more readable comments. There's also some crazy level of thinking in the code. As Rolig developers, we know that we probably shouldn't handle a single case, we should handle a generic case. And if we're you know, clever roguelike developers, as we all are, we know to handle edge cases, but NetHack handles things that can't even happen. There's code that explicitly says in the comments that this, you know, this could never happen. So for example, two weaponing, if you have a two weapon that's a corpse, that can't happen, you're not allowed to two weapon if you're wielding a corpse, but if you did, the code is already there to handle it. <laughs> and this explains a lot about why NetHack is as flexible it is, as it is and doesn't crash too often even when you do crazy things, because even if you did something developers thought you could never do, they still wrote code for it. This partly is, you know, a matter of making it, you know, safer, easier to run code where, you know, even though the dev team thinks of everything, maybe they didn't think of something that you just did except gotcha, they did and wrote code for it. But uh, they also, it's there for easy expandability as they add new features or as someone wants to kind of mod it into their own version. So an example is that when you are equipping different types of you know, armor and things like that, there are functions that run when you do that equip action that can handle any special behavior. So say you put on some boots of levitation and you need to run some special code to start levitating. There's a function for each type of uh, kind of armor or clothing that you put on and this includes there's a function for when you equip a shield even though as the comment notes there are currently no shields that have this type of special handling code but in case anyone ever wants to add one that does they've put the function in there so that it's following the same kind of format as all the similar functions and it's just waiting for someone to have a need to put the functionality in it which I think is a really brilliant way of having a uh, it's saving yourself problems in the future, that at the point they were writing this code, they wrote it further than it had to be, so that if later on someone wants to go down that last few you know, miles, it's already set up for them. There's also some general dev wisdom that is not particular to roguelites or technical things, but it was fun to find. You can learn a lot philosophically from the NetHack code. For example, a lock is made only for the honest man, the thief will break it. A comment in the code for unlocking things, which has nothing to do with the technical uh, implementation or the gameplay. Just there for you to ruminate on. Or the rhetorical question <laughs> in the tool definition. If tin whistles are made of tin, what do they make foghorns out of? It's a good question. I don't know why it's in the definition of the tools you can have in NetHack, but it's there.
And that's not all, there's lots of others. This is why, this is, I had four pages of notes of fun things I found in the NetHack code, and that was not with me having enough time to go through like everything with a fine tooth comb. So really, if you go looking yourself, I know you'll find even more of these. And sometimes the devs are also uh, frustrated in the same way that any of us are frustrated. For example, there's a Boolean parameter, and the comment is, so I can't think of a good name, sue me. I love the comment that the Jubilex level does not have moats, but it does have moats. There's probably a better way to express this. Or, in the case where the devs are in the right, but obviously have dealt with people who think they're in the wrong, the cloak of magic resistance can be described as an ornamental cope, and as the comment says, cope is not a spelling mistake, leave it be. <laughs> if you didn't know, it's like a priest robe. I didn't know until I googled it, so I would have been one of the ignorant people thinking, isn't that a spelling mistake? But, I want to just try and have a bit of a, a, a demonstration of the joy that I felt when I was going through the code. Because the way that I discovered this is that I'm looking through the code and I'm scrolling and I'm scrolling and I'm trying to keep an eye out. You know, originally what I was doing was trying to implement things. In this case, I was doing some look just for like what's interesting. <laughs> and there's a special feeling when you're scrolling around and you see, if not Popeye stoned, and you have to wonder what does that do and why is it in this area of code. And you do a quick find and you look through the source code and discover the function Popeye, which <laughs> checks if the tin that you're currently eating could possibly save your life. So that if it could, you continue eating it uh, instead of being interrupted to try and have another chance to save your life. But if it can't help you, it'll let you stop so that you can try and pray or something like that. And it is so named, as the comment says, because Popeye the sailor gets out of trouble by eating tins of spinach. I think this is funny since a tin of spinach will never save your life. But there's, there's a kind of joy to being someone looking through the code base without knowing. I mean, if you read the NetHack wiki and things like that, you might be familiar with a lot of the spoilers in terms of the funny kind of things that the game will handle, special messages that you can get. But there's a whole other level to that same feeling that you get when you're looking through the source code. Even if you're not trying to understand it in a technical sense, you can be understanding it in a learning more about NetHack sense, and it really is very fun and fulfilling. And in terms of the NetHack wiki, something that's really cool in terms of getting into looking at the code is that if you're on the wiki and you're looking at a particular you know, type of object or something like that, you'll see these footnotes, and they're actually footnotes directly into the source code. So that can be a cool area of entry of if you're looking at all these C files, you don't know where to get started. Well, you can follow this as a place to start and that'll get you into the code and you can start you know, looking through. And I think you can very naturally, if you find something that looks interesting, you know, have it open in whatever is your favorite code editor, do a like control F find, you know, follow it through and you can easily lose several hours or days of your life just following all of the interesting little threads in what the code is doing. And so I want to encourage everyone that, you know, if you ever find yourself with the time, you should go check out the NetHack source code. It's easily accessible now on Git. And, you know, I only went into the NetHack source code because it's what I was familiar with, but uh, I know that Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup, I'm pretty sure, is uh, source code is accessible. Angban, the source code is accessible. I'm sure many, many others. So, you know, take your favorite roguelikes, look around, see if the source code is out there, and give them a look. Because even if it's in a language that you don't know, even if you're not someone who considers yourself extremely uh, technically, you know, strong or competent. You can learn a lot just through comments. You can learn a lot more about your favorite roguelike, and you can learn a lot of techniques that'll help you in your later roguelikes. So, thank you. I have no idea what time it is. Did I go over time or under time? Under time. Do you want to take Whoa. Questions? Yeah, I can take questions. Okay, we have time for a few questions. Uh, so you mentioned stir-cat and stir-kitten. Do you know about stir-fry? <laughs> it randomizes the string. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Or jokes, I'll take that. <laughs> you said you started spelunking in here to make, your, make changes to the game. What kind of changes have you tried to do? Or have you done, I guess? 
Sure. So I was doing a uh, honors thesis kind of research project for my bachelor comp sci degree, and I was looking at how to make roguelike games, but specifically NetHack, more accessible for visually impaired players. And kind of the basic idea of that is just that since it is a ASCII text display, uh, screen reading software is able to read those characters aloud and make it a game you can listen to instead of having to see. So even someone who's totally blind could listen to the dungeon. There's a great episode of Roguelike Radio that covers this. and. Because of that, they're at a baseline level accessible, but it's also kind of awful to have to listen to like dot, dot, at, dot, 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 hash. And so I was looking at implementing some simple functionality that can make that better. So uh, Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup already is a lot better in this regard than NetHack was, in that there were uh, time-saving functions that would let you auto-path to a feature that you'd seen in the dungeon. So what I was looking at was adding similar functions to NetHack that would let you get a list of notable features in the dungeon that you've seen already, ways to path to those, because the main thing that was frustrating for visually impaired players was the movement around the dungeon. Once you get into a fight, you know, a lot of the text is already displayed to you in a text way that's easy to read, but positional stuff was difficult. So I was adding functionality to do that through text. And my... Source code's kind of out there in the wild, and it didn't get directly merged in, but the NetHack dev team did actually look at the work I'd done and add some of those changes, implemented kind of their own way to the latest releases of NetHack. So that's like a life accomplishment <laughs> for me. OK, cool. So they're swapping the computer, but I'm still taking questions. So someone have the microphone? Someone right have here. a question? All right. Um, one other silly one from the code, I haven't done as deep a dive into it as you have, but the contents of the box that you get from uh, from the quantum mechanic aren't decided until you open the box, just for the uh, Schrodinger's cat joke. <laughs> I did see that, and I, I think that a lot of the variable names and function names dealing with Schrodinger's cat are also pretty, pretty amusing, yes. <laughs> I just had a question. Now that you've been staring at this code for so long, do you have any impression about the personalities or philosophy of the, you know, like looking at the Bible a little too long or something? <laughs> uh, so about the personalities and things, uh, if anything, I'm surprised by how consistent it is. I would have expected that given that, you know, several people over time have worked on the NetHack code, that you would get a sense of uh, individual personalities. I do think it's interesting that, because uh, some of the, Comments and things like that are signed with initials, um, but I don't know like who belongs to those initials. And so there is uh, there's one that starts with a K that like is with the funny comments half of the time. So they're my favorite. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, I think that you can see the humor of NetHack reflected in the code. Because I think that, you know, I think it was mentioned earlier today in terms of NetHack was too crazy. And, you know, you've got your tourist class, you've got all these kind of things. And I think you see that in the code and that you see these comments that have nothing to do with the actual implementation. You see jokes and references that are in the comments in the same way you see jokes and references in the game. So I think it's cool how much there's a personality that comes across in the code and the comments. And you can see uh, sensibilities of the time. Like, I think actually the hardest thing about reading the NetHack hack source code when you start is that they do have variable names that are as short as possible. So you get really used to thinking of monster as just mon and object as like obj and, and stuff like that. Like I had the joke of uh, renamed disco is a variable name. Disco is short for discovery. So everything is shortened in that way, which makes it hard to read at first. But I thought it was funny that the recent changes to support having Sir Terry Pratchett's novels show up. Uh, the function is actually called like Sir Terry Novels. And I was like, that would never fly back in the old day, man. <laughs> That's too many characters. You can tell this is new. <laughs> hey, did you find anything that you were like, oh, wow, I should, I should try this? Did you find anything that you felt like you wanted to maybe use for your own projects or that really like inspired you? Like, did you, like, there's a lot of funny stuff, but did you find stuff that you're like, oh, I, I should give this a shot myself? Yeah, so in terms of things that inspired me to give it a shot myself, really like my favorite thing, as random as it is, was that body parts system. And it, it just seemed to me like such an elegant way that when you look at the code that you get displayed to you in NetHack, it seems like 
in the mention of it being like an artificial dungeon master, it seems so smart and that it seems like it always knows what you're doing, you know, no matter what kind of creature you've been turned into, no matter what action you're taking, like if something, if a cream pie gets launched at you and you're a floating eye, it'll say that like you get cream pie in your eye. And I'm like, how does it handle all of these cases and seeing that it's such an elegant solution where every type of body part is just in this very a one-off function that's implemented in such an easy to read way. I found that really inspiring in terms of um, ways to have very specific output that's handled in a very generic way. Cool, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks.